Thank you, Josh. Thank you for coming. It wasn't that bad when you got out there. A little windy, a little cold, but hey, you're tougher than that. So glad you're here this morning. Uh, as you open your Bible to John chapter 10, how many of you here like Lord of the Rings books or movies? Anybody? Some of you do. Okay. 10 or 20 of us. Okay. I kind of like them. I don't, like, I don't do a lot of fiction reading, but I, I read those books. I like them because... Um, they're filled with Christian imagery, and Tolkien was a Christian, and a lot of that in there. So I just enjoy those. And then when the movies came out, the first movie came out in 01, I was so excited to go see it. And, you know, my wife, I take her to a movie, you know, once every year or so, whether we need it or not, we'll go to a movie. And so I wanted to take her to a movie. We went to that movie. And after the, the first of the three movies was over... And my wife didn't know there were three books, didn't know there were going to be three movies. And so, you know, Frodo and Sam go off to Mount Doom. They're going to try to throw the ring in the fire. And Gimli, Legolas, and Aragorn, they go off to fight the horrible enemy, you know, these demonic creatures. And as, as they're doing that, and the movie ends, and my wife looks at me and says, Is that it? And I said, no, actually, there's much more to come. There's two more movies. And, oh, okay. I mean, it seemed like that wasn't all of it. No, it wasn't. And when we are going through a Bible study, whatever we're studying about, whatever we're looking at, and we get to the end of it, like last week, we get to the end of it, and we say, is that it? And the answer is no. There's much more to come. And you can be sure that whenever you're reading Scripture, whenever you're doing Bible study, you can put a lot of effort in it, but there is more to come. That's the way it is with the Good Shepherd. We started last week in John 10. We were looking at the Good Shepherd, and it's an incredible study, and I was trying to make it all in once, but I thought, no, 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 there's no way, so it wound up being two parts. And the idea of the Good Shepherd starts with bad news, but it ends with good news. And the bad news is this, that the Bible says we're sheep, Okay. That's bad news because sheep are not very smart, they're not very strong, they're not very skillful at taking care of themselves, but the Bible says, oh, we like sheep have gone astray. So it doesn't start off very good, but it gets better very, very quickly because the sheep have a shepherd. In Psalm 23 that we all know, the Lord is my shepherd. And then in the New Testament, he is the chief shepherd. Here he is the good shepherd and in Hebrews 13 20 it says he is the great shepherd of the sheep and so we're looking at the good shepherd and if you've come here today and you feel like life's kind of out of control and I really don't know what to do and I'm kind of vulnerable and I don't know how to take care of myself and I'm always getting in a mess and I just need somebody to help me. Okay we're sheep. But we have a fantastic shepherd. So we're going to read in John 10. Before we do, let me remind you where we were last week. We saw several things about the good shepherd last week. Number one, he leads us. Okay, The shepherd leads the sheep. So when you're trying to figure out your way through life, here's what you do. You stay close to the shepherd. If you stay close to the shepherd, you may miss a turn or two here and there. But if you stay close to the shepherd... You're going to wind up in the right place. So he leads us. And then the scripture says, he lays down his life for the sheep. That's us. And God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And the son would come to earth to be our sacrifice. The sacrifice for our sin that takes care of our sin problem and our separation problem. And the amazing thing is that the shepherd becomes one of the sheep, although a sinless lamb. And he is the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. So he lays down his life for us. Jesus died on the cross for you. We had problems we could not deal with. He laid down his life to deal with it for us. And then he rose. So he laid down his life. Third thing we saw last week was that Jesus knows the sheep. I go around apologizing all the time because I don't know everybody. I mean, there's new people every week, and people go to Dallas, and new people come, and I'm trying to learn everybody, but I don't know everybody's name. 
One of the great favors you can do for me if you're fairly new here is just come up and say, Pastor, I know you're old and forgetful. My name is so-and-so, okay? I won't be offended by that at all. I will appreciate your help. I don't know everybody, but Jesus does. He knows everything about you. He knows all the issues you're facing. You know all, uh, he knows all the things that scare you. He knows all the things you're dealing with. He knows. And so when you pray, you can just be honest, pour out those prayers because he already knows. He knows everything about you. And then, last thing we saw last week was that Jesus owns the sheep. You are not your own. If you're a believer, if you're one of the sheep and not one of the goats, you are not your own. You've been bought with a price. He is, you are his possession. And he cares about you because he owns you. You belong to him. He's going to take care of you. We're going to see that this morning because he owns you. And we've got to get over this thing about I can make all my own decisions. I can do whatever I want to. No, no, no. I have an owner, a Lord, a master, and I listen to him, and I try to do what he tells me to do. So all those things, part one, last week, the good shepherd. This week, we start and see some more things about him. Let's start with verse 10. It says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. Everything's negative about the thief, but positive about Jesus. I came, Jesus said, so that they would have life. And have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand, not a shepherd, who is not the owner of the sheep, he sees the wolf coming and he leaves the sheep and flees and the wolf snatches them and scatters the flock. He flees because he is not, he is a hired hand and does not care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd. And I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold, I must bring them also. And they will listen to my voice, and they will become one flock with one shepherd. And then several months later, he says this in verse 24, the Jews surrounded him, began saying to him, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. And Jesus answered, I told you, you do not believe because he says, you're not my sheep. And then verse 27, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them, they follow me, I give them eternal life. They will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. And the Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Now what's going on here? Jesus makes several I am statements in the book of John, seven of them to be exact. And here he's giving us another one, and he says, I am the good shepherd. And last week we saw part of what that means. This morning we'll see more. The first one that we'll see this morning is this in verse 16, that the good shepherd owns all the sheep. Last week we saw the good shepherd owns the sheep, but he owns all of them. Look at verse 16. He says, I have other sheep that are not of this fold, and I must bring them also. They will listen to my voice. They will become one flock with one shepherd. Jesus owns all the sheep. Now, what's he talking about here in verse 16? He's talking about his Jewish flock. That's who he came for. He came for the lost sheep of Israel, the Jewish people. And he wanted them to receive their Messiah. That's who he was. They've been looking for Messiah for hundreds of years. And he said, here I am. But his own people rejected him by and large. But he's going to gather a flock from these. And he's already started. He's got these disciples. And some people are going to come to him and be faithful to him. But this is what he says in verse 16. I have other sheep. They're not of this fold. This is the Jewish fold. And I have other sheep, and they're going to become also. That's that's the Gentiles. 
Now, you and I need to be thankful for verse 16. Because if he just came for the lost sheep of Israel, we're in trouble. Most of us are not Jewish. We did, however, in the first service, baptize a man, Michael, and he was raised Jewish. He was born into a Jewish home, raised Jewish. Several years ago, he found his Messiah, Jesus Christ, and this morning he got baptized. That's a great thing. Part of the one flock. But Jesus brings his Jewish followers, and he brings his Gentile followers, and he brings them together into one flock. Now, folks, that's important for us to understand today, that when you look out and you see all the different so-called flocks, see all the different groups, really, if you're really a sheep, you're in one flock, and if you're following the one shepherd, you're part of that one flock. I think it's important for us to remember that. We gather here this morning, we're one of many, many churches throughout Lubbock, and we're seriously trying to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. But we're not the whole flock, we're just part of the flock. There's a whole bunch of other folks. If you look at the world today, the Christian world today, it looks very, very badly from distorted and and, uh, disunited And there's three big, big outward flocks. There's the Catholic, and then there's the Orthodox, and then there's the Protestant. Of the Protestant, there are the Evangelicals, and there are those that are not Evangelical. Of the Evangelicals, there's the Baptist, and the Nazarene, and the Church of Christ, and the Assemblies of God, and the Non-Denominationals. And then of the Baptist... There's a hundred kinds of us. There's the Southern Baptist and the American Baptist and the National Baptist and the Primitive Baptist, the Free Will Baptist, the Missionary Baptist, all different kinds. And then on top of all that, you've got people in various churches and they're primarily there because of language issues. And so you've got Hispanic churches, you've got Korean churches, you've got Chinese churches, you've got African American churches that have their own culture and their own way of doing things. you got all these things. And so if you just look at it from the outside, oh my goodness, we're so divided. There's a thousand flocks. But Jesus says, there's one flock. And if you're following the one shepherd, you're part of the one flock. Now on the outward, I mean, there's a lot of disunity and all that, different names. Everybody's got a different name above the door. But when it gets to the heart issue, folks, if we're following the real shepherd, if we're one of the real sheep, not one of the goats, we're one of the sheep, we're part of the one flock. And we need to remember that. When you drive by that church and that church building and you know that they're really followers of Jesus and we disagree with them on some things and, you know, we got some differences and the way we worship may be a little different or whatever, but as you drive by, pray for them because they're, they're your brothers and sisters in Christ. They're part of the flock. We need the sheep to stop biting each other and kicking each other and just kind of huddle closer to each other. We need to do that because... We live in a world that is hostile to Christians, and it's becoming increasingly more so. We we used to have what was called the Judeo-Christian culture, and by that it was meant that even though we may not be Christians, we still respect the Judeo-Christian culture. When I first began my ministry a long time ago, I could say to people, well, the Bible says, and they would say, well, okay, I'll listen to that. May not believe it, might not follow it, but I'll listen to it. Today, you say the Bible says, and they say, who cares? It's different. And so what we, as part of the one flock with the one shepherd, we have to love each other and appreciate each other. And yes, we've got some differences. And when we show up in heaven, folks, you know what? He's going to show all of us how we missed it. But if we're one of the flock, one of the sheep, and he's the shepherd, he says, come in. And there, forever and forever and forever, we're going to get to know the rest of our brothers and sisters in Christ. One flock, one shepherd, it all belongs to Jesus Christ. Here's the second thing we see in this text. 
The good shepherd owns all of the sheep, Jew, Gentile, Baptist, Church of Christ, Catholic, whatever, all those who really belong to him, he owns them. Second, the good shepherd gives life to the sheep. Now notice what he says in verse 10. The thief, that was pointing back to the religious leaders of that day, but anybody that was really activated by Satan and not the Savior... The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. They don't really care about the sheep. They're out to hurt the sheep. But Jesus said, I came so they would have life and have it abundantly. So there's the one who brings destruction and there's the one who brings life. And that's Jesus. And then in verse 28, verse 27, he says, my sheep listen. They hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. And then look in verse 28. And I give, if you don't earn it, he gives it. I give them eternal life. He is life. And when we know him and we receive him, we have life. So the good shepherd gives life to the sheep. And you say, well, why do we need that? Because the scripture says we are dead. We're dead in trespasses and sins, separated from God. Adam and Eve had a choice. God said, if you eat of this tree, if you don't eat of this tree, everything's going to be great. If you eat of this tree, you will surely die. They ate. They didn't die physically that day, but they died spiritually. They were separated from God, and God came looking for them, and they hid themselves. They were spiritually dead to God, and they were separated. And they passed that on through the race, and we've chosen it for ourselves, and Now we are separated, just in our natural state. You may be living and breathing physically, but without Christ, we are dead in trespasses and sins. And Jesus comes into the world. He is the life. And when we receive him, we get life. It's part of the deal. It's what we get when we come to him. We get life. The book of John is all about life. It says in chapter 1, in him, Jesus, the word, in him was life. John 3, 16, whoever believes shall not perish but have what? Everlasting life, eternal life, life unto the ages. Chapter 5 says, he who believes has eternal life. In chapter 6, it says Jesus is the bread of life. Here, it says he gives eternal life. John chapter 11, which we'll probably see next week, it shows him raising Lazarus from the dead. That was not just to show off. That was to show, look, I I can give life. And John 14, it says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is life. And he gives life. And when you receive him, boom, you come to life in him. Now, the life he gives, there's a couple of aspects to it. John 10 says it's abundant. He says, I came so that they would have life. And by the way, that word is Zoe or Zoe. If your name here, if you're, that's your name, that you're named after this verse. And this word. I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. Jesus does not want you to just have a little bit of that special, beautiful spiritual life. He wants you to have a truckload of it. And so he says, abundant life. And then he goes on to verse 28 and he says, There, I give them eternal life. So the life is not only abundant. But it is eternal, everlasting, life into the ages. That's how that word is translated. And so we get all of that. We get it abundantly when we come to Christ. It is abundant. We also get it eternally. An eternal life, we want to think about it. Often we just think about it in terms of quantity. And we need to, but we need to also think about it in terms of quality. In Quantity, it starts when you receive Jesus. I understand. It doesn't start when you go to heaven. Okay? It gets better then, but it doesn't start then. It starts the moment you receive Jesus. To have Jesus is to have life. 
So when you receive Jesus as your Savior, he gives you that eternal life. And then it goes on forever and forever and forever. That's a wonderful, wonderful thing. I mean, it, you don't run out of eternal life. It just keeps on getting better and better and better all the time. And that is especially good for the few of us in this room that are senior adults. Okay? I got talking about senior adult one day, and then I remembered, now, oh, wait a minute, you are a senior adult. <laughs> and if you're a senior adult, what that means is more of your earthly life is behind you than ahead of you. Okay? But if you're a Christian, that's really not a big deal. Because when I run out of this brief little life that I have here and cross over into glory, Jesus calls my name and I go to be with him because he is so good and kind, not because I'm great. I go to be with him and I step over into that new threshold. And all of this life was just like the little forward to the book. It was just like, you know, a couple of pages of introduction. And this is the book. And we step over and we step over into eternal life. And it just better and better and better. And it lasts forever and forever. And in heaven you never get old. It's an incredible thing. But not only is there a quantity of it, but there is a quality. We wouldn't want it if it was miserable. Think about this. If you got eternal life that was going to last forever and forever and forever. And you're going to be miserable in it. I mean, that's hell. Okay? They got death, but they're conscious, and it's forever and forever, and it's horrible. Well, when you have eternal life, there is that quantity to it, but also that quality. It is fantastic. When you cross over into glory, no more sickness, no more sorrow, no more pain, no more death. There are people all over this room, and you got various things, you know, rheumatoid arthritis and this or that, and you got, you know, irritable insides. I mean, you just got just all kinds of hurts and pains and headaches and migraines and all that stuff. When you cross over into glory, that's done away with. Not any of that anymore. No more temptations. No more suffering. No more sorrow. Nobody you love dies. All that, it's so good. Quantity and quality. And folks, listen. Jesus, who is life, offers himself and he says, you can have this. You can have it. And you know, the wonderful thing, every Sunday that I get to stand up and tell a crowd about Jesus, there's the possibility that Sunday that somebody that is dead can come to life. Maybe you've come here today and you're physically alive, but you're spiritually dead. You do not know Jesus in a life-transforming way. And the Bible says, whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. The Bible says we can step out of death into life because of what Jesus has done in his cross and in his resurrection. That he offers life. It says here he wants to give it. He offers life. And he wants us to have it. And you've got to receive it. And it's possible this morning, somebody, I don't know everybody here, don't know everybody's spiritual condition, but you may be sitting here today, you're very much alive physically, but you're deader than a hammer spiritually. And you can cry out to Jesus this morning, Lord, I turn from my old way and I trust in you. I believe you died on the cross. I believe you're my Savior. And he comes into your life. And he changes you. That could happen this very morning. A miracle could happen in this place today. The good shepherd, he gives life. The good shepherd, third we see this morning, he is the God of the sheep. Now look at verse 30. Jesus is saying, I and the Father, we work in coordination. I and the Father are one. That does not mean they're identical. It means they have a unity. The Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Father. But they are both God. And the Jews knew what he was talking about because the next verse says they picked up stones to stone him. Like they had done in chapter 8 when he previously said, I, I'm God. And they said, you're a blasphemer. And they wanted to kill him. And here, same thing happens because Jesus said, I am the Father. 
He is God. I am God. We are one. That's an incredible claim. One of the things about the book of John is that it shows the deity of Christ. That's one of the highlights of the book. And he shows us that he is God. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. And through his claims, all these I am statements, he's saying, I am the one and only. I am God. And he said, I'll prove it. And the seven signs that he does in the book of John, they're the proof. Who else can do this? Who else can walk on water? Who else can turn water to wine? Who else can raise the dead after they've been in the grave for four days? Jesus said, it's me. It's proof. I am God. And at the end of the book, Thomas, the doubter, the skeptic, said, after he saw Jesus in his resurrection appearance, Thomas said, my Lord and my God. I hope that everybody here can say that today. He is my Lord, my boss, my master. He tells me what to do. And he is my God. And folks, when he is your God, listen, when he is your God, there's no problem going on in your life that's too big for him. Nothing is impossible with God. Nothing is too difficult for him. You bring whatever's going on. I'm the weak little sheep. You are the great shepherd who is God. And I bring all my needs to you. And I bow before you, my good shepherd, and I trust you're going to take care of me. And that's what we see finally in this text this morning. Good shepherd owns all the sheep. He gives life to those. He is our God, not just some great person. He is our God. And the good shepherd finally protects the sheep. He protects us. Sheep have to be protected. And he protects us. Verse 28. I give them eternal life that never stops. And they will never perish. Get that. Never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. Do you see what he's saying? I'm protecting you. In 1 Peter it says, we are kept or guarded by the power of God. In Romans 8, it says nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Tribulation, trouble, famine, nakedness, sword. He says, I'm convinced neither death nor life, angels, principalities, things present, things to come, powers, height, depth. No other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And here he's saying the same thing. We will never perish and nobody is going to take us out of the hand of God. been watching a little bit of the World Series and they keep playing the same old commercials over and over and over again but one of them is about Allstate and it says you're in good hands with Allstate. Now I don't know about that. I don't know. Maybe. But I know that I'm in the hand of God. I'm in the hand of Jesus. I'm in the hand of the Father. I'm doubly dipped in the power of God. I'm in good hands. And if you're one of the sheep you are too. And nobody's going to snatch you out of his hand. And you're never going to perish. Now listen, it doesn't mean nothing bad is ever going to happen to you. Okay, We live in a fallen, broken world. Hebrews 11 says the greats of the faith, some were tortured, some were mocked, some were flogged, some were imprisoned, some were stones, some were destitute, some were afflicted. Some bad things happen in this life. But you're never going to perish. That is to be removed from God. That's not going to happen. You're safe in his hands. And that ought to give you some peace today, folks. Maybe you're one of those people, you go home at night, you can't sleep because you're worried. There's wars and rumors of wars. I might lose my job. Bad things are happening. Is the economy going to fall apart? Is there going to be a new COVID plague and we're all going to be affected and whatever and all that stuff? And you just worry, worry, worry. Listen, if you're one of the sheep and you're in his hands, you may go through some rough stuff in life, but you're not going to perish. And nobody's going to pull you out of his hands and he's going to carry you over into glory. We can stop all the worrying and trust the shepherd. He's going to take care of us. 
And he will protect the sheep. And nothing that Satan forms against you can prosper as long as he's ready to bat it away. And when it has to do with your eternality, you will not be affected. You will be in his hands and you will be kept. By the very, very, very good shepherd. So, listen. We are sheep. <laughs> Helpless. Defenseless. Not very bright. But he's a good shepherd. He's a great shepherd. And we are bought and paid for. By his blood. In his hand. We can trust him. And if you're not here today, you're not one of his sheep. I don't know why you wouldn't want to be. And he's got better things for you. You can come to him. He will be your shepherd. And those of us that are part of the flock, we're sheep. We can thank him for how good he is to us. Thank you, Lord God, that every step of the way, though I would fall into traps, I would starve to death. I would be lost. I would be confused. You are my good shepherd. And you are going to take care of me. So let's thank him for that this morning. Would you bow with me? Lord Jesus, thank you that you are such a good shepherd to us. And you don't have to be. You chose to love us. Thank you. And we thank you for that. We thank you that we can rest in you. Lord, help us to follow you and you'll take us to better places. Thank you for all that. Thank you that we have eternal life, quantity and quality. Thank you. Thank you for every good and perfect thing. It all comes from you. And Lord, we pray, I don't know, there may be somebody here today, Lord, I don't know, that doesn't know you, that's not part of the flock. And I pray that your Holy Spirit would turn the light on for that person and they would cry out to you and receive you and they would be different and then I pray for all your sheep today all the ones that belong to you and we would rest in your hands we would know you are going to take care of us and we'll want to stay as close to you as we possibly can because that is the very smartest place to be thank you Lord God help us all this morning we pray in Jesus name